All right, let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to uh, John chapter 15. Just want to take this uh, next few moments and talk about the role of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit as Jesus spoke of him in uh, John 13 to 17. Let's pray. Father, we do love your presence. Holy Spirit, you manifest yourself. Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, your spirit dwells in us and that he takes the things, Father, that belong to you and the things that belong to your son, the things that are near and dear, He declares them to us. Father, thank you for your spirit. Show us more. Lord, we want to know him better. We honor you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in John chapter 15, Verse 26, Jesus talks about the the coming of the helper, the Holy Spirit. And he says that he will send him and that he comes and he proceeds from the Father. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. But what is interesting is that in John 13 to 17, the most repeated attribute of the Holy Spirit is that of helper. And the second one is that he's the spirit of truth. The helper who is the spirit of truth. Now, the, one of the main emphases of John 13 to 17 is this glorious reality of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This divine family dynamic. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they have been in fellowship with one another in eternity past, now, and forever. And we're speaking of the doctrine of the Trinity. There in paragraph, there in Roman number one, I call it the Trinitarian Fellowship as the realm of fire. And the reason why I like to call it the realm of fire is because of the several references where God is showing himself forth as a consuming fire. But it's this glorious reality of where we discover God's love for God. It's the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for his Father. The Father's love for the Spirit, the Spirit's love for the Father, and so forth. And as we interact with that divine family dynamic, we begin to grow in the experiential understanding of how God feels for us. There in Isaiah 33, verse 14, it talks about dwelling in everlasting burnings, this realm of fire, God's glory, God's presence, and God's love. Now, again, it it bears repeating that the the context of John 13 to 17, and I I think I say this every time when I teach on uh, these passages, it's just by way of reminder that it, It happens two days after Jesus taught his disciples about the unique dynamics, these pressures that will come on the earth in the generation of the Lord's return. In fact, um, in other passages in the Gospels, Jesus highlights these four 
uh, negative emotions that will emerge in the human heart in light of these pressures. They're fear, offense, lust, and deception. Fear, offense, lust, and deception. And I believe that these negative emotions, they result from a heart that is disconnected from Jesus in place of prayer and disconnected from Jesus' plan and storyline, namely the gospel, where the storyline of the gospel, God's plan of redemption, it, it gives us perspective. If anything, it gives us hope of where things are going. And as these pressures increase, a prayerless heart is a heart that is devoid of the life of the Spirit, releasing the transformative power of Christ on the inside, changing our emotional chemistry, and you are therefore left to your own devices, and so these negative emotions begin to emerge. And then secondly, when we have a disconnect from the narrative of what is happening, then everything that is happening around us will begin to uh, touch our hearts and our minds with confusion. And so in John 13 to 17, one of the things we see is that Jesus, he is seeking to connect us with our inheritance as believers. It's, it's absolutely glorious what we see in John 13 and 17. This idea of connecting with God's love, God's glory, by engaging in the Trinitarian conversation. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are actively relating with one another. They are, they are in deep fellowship with one another, deeply committed to one another, deeply filled with eternal love for one another, eternal joy, delight, enjoyment, passion. And our inheritance is to be caught up in that fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, I don't have it in the notes, Paul uh, tells us that we have been called to the fellowship of the Son as believers. And he's referring to this, this community, this divine community, this divine family, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We've been called to experience that fellowship called intimacy with God. It's where we experience the power of God's love. Psalm 63, verse 3, where it says that his love is better than life. It's the place where we can experience the, uh, the superior pleasures of the gospel. It is our privilege. It's our glory. It's our destiny as believers to participate in this. Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 5, he talks about the glory that he had with the Father before the foundations of the earth. He talks about this relational dynamic called the glory he had with the Father, John 17, verse 5. But several verses later in John 17, verse 22, Jesus referring to that glory, he says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given it to them. What a promise. And he's given us access through the cross. He's given us access to the glory. He's given us access to the fellowship, the relationship, the presence of God through the cross. Jesus goes on to say later on in John 17, verse 24, that this is his desire for us, that we would behold his glory, that we would interact with this 
Trinitarian dynamic, that it was this desire that was one of the things that drove Jesus to the cross was to give us this access to the presence of God. Again, Jesus, paragraph C, Jesus warned us, he warned the end time generation about these, about the rise of these negative emotions. And these negative emotions, they can be summed up by what Jesus prophesies in Matthew 24, verse 17. He calls it the love of many growing cold. These, again, these four negative emotions can be summed up in this one phrase, the love of many growing cold. However, as believers, um, because of the born-again experience, we have the hope, the privilege, the opportunity, the invitation to interact with red-hot divine love, the realm of fire, the place of everlasting burnings. In Song of Solomon, chapter 8 Verse 6 and 7, it talks about the seal of God's love, the fire of God's love, the flames of God's love taking hold of the human heart. It's the first commandment in first place. As we experience God's love for God and we experience God's love for us, which is of the same intensity as God's love for God, the Song of Solomon calls it the, uh, the most vehement flames the very flames of God grabbing hold of the heart. And then in verse 7 of Song of Solomon 8, it tells us that there is no waters. In other words, there's no pressures. There is no negative emotion. There's no temptation. There's no sin that can snuff out the fire of God's love. And so when we're talking about the fire of God's love, we're really talking about, if I can say it this way, really the only place of safety is a heart that's equipped and anointed with the first commandment upon our hearts. Paragraph D, the father, again, he, his answer to this cold love is to have an end time witness, the body of Christ, anointed with the seal of love or the seal of fire as we just talked about out of Song of Solomon. And so we are invited Paragraph D, we're, we are invited to, to dwell. You know, it says in Isaiah 33, verse 14, who, can, who among us can dwell with everlasting burning? Instead of dwell, we can say, who can live? Who can dwell? Who can abide? Who, who can stay there? Who can live in that reality, in that realm, so to speak? And so we are invited to, to dwell in the place of God's love. And the way that we dwell in God's love is by interacting with God, number one, where we, we speak to him, we speak weak words, simple phrases to the Lord. We speak the truth of who he is back to him. We express our hearts to him through the word. And so we interact with him Number one, number two, we receive of his love. And so dwelling in God's love or dwelling in God's fire or abiding in God is by interacting with him, number one. Number two, receiving of him. And then thirdly, releasing back to him what we receive from him and, re and releasing to others what we receive from him. And so we interact with God, we receive of his love, we, we express our love back to him, in particular through lives of obedience, and we extend love to others. Now, in uh, paragraph E, Moses was the first one that I could find that encountered the realm of God's fire. And it happened in the context of God revealing his name as the I am. The I am, where Moses experienced the, the holiness of God or the transcendence of God or the, the majesty of God, 
where the name of God, the glory of God was consumed by the fire of God, of God's zealous love. Now, paragraph F, I just want to point to number three there. We see that the spirit is consumed with fire. And so when the Lord in Deuteronomy 4.24 says that I am a consuming fire, it, it is really a Trinitarian reality because the Father is a consuming fire, the Son is a consuming fire, the Holy Spirit is a consuming fire. The primary on-ramp to experiencing the fire of God's love is by interacting with God through his word. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29, he says that, he said, is not my word like a fire? Jesus, in Luke 24, 20, uh, 32, when he was opening up the scriptures, he was opening up the scriptures from the law, the Psalms, the prophets. And uh, we know the story, he the disciples, and excuse me, he's with the disciples, he breaks the bread, and when he breaks the bread, their eyes are opened as to who he is, and he disappears, and they look at one another, and they said, did not our hearts burn when he talked with us on the road while he opened up the scriptures? And so that's when the Holy Spirit, as we interact with the Lord through the word, opens up the scriptures when our hearts get connected with this place of, of fires. So let's go to page two. This is given just a, a just a brief, this is a brief overview about the Trinity. And one of the reasons why I want to do this, because I, again, it's 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 obvious, but again, it's just it just bears repeating that that the Holy Spirit is God. <laughs> he's not just the, he's not just some invisible force. He is the uncreated God. He is God, very God, as it says in one of the creeds. As the Father is God, so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. As the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. He's not merely, you know, God's tickle feather to make us laugh in the chairs. No, he is creator God. He is transcendent God. He is the one of whom the angels around the throne cry out, holy, holy, holy. As much as they do of the Son, as much as they do of the Father, the Holy Spirit is God. The term Trinity, paragraph A, is not found in Scripture. However, we do see the idea of the unity of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three distinct persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but there is only one God. Paragraph B, the doctrine of the Trinity teaches us again that God exists in three persons, three distinct persons. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. Each distinct person is fully and eternally God. The Holy Spirit is eternally God. He is to be honored, He is to be feared as one who is eternally God, as the Father is, the Son is. Yet there's only one God. And so the mystery of the Trinity, is again, is that there are three divine persons who dwell together forever in deep relationship. 
all persons are co-eternal, together, equal, Jesus equal to the Father, as touching his deity, as it says in the creeds. Now, what's interesting is um, he's co-eternal and he's equal. Jesus equal to the Father insofar as his divinity. The Spirit equal to the Father and to Jesus insofar as the divinity. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But in John 14, Jesus says that I will send another helper. Another and in the, in the original language, there are, I'm not going to try to say it, but there are two different words that could be used there. And one of them means that another one that is different. Or there's another word that says another one who is equal. And another one who is equal, that's the word that's being used there. The Holy Spirit, equally God as the Son, who's equally God as the Father. Paragraph C, again, the Holy Spirit is God. I got the verses there for you to look at. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, or the way, another way to say is where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. Where it's not just, oh, the Holy Spirit is here and let's gonna, you know, throw the chairs around. That's not the liberty that Paul is referring to. He's referring to the, the liberty uh, to love God, the liberty to obey and to follow God, uh, 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 to have that, the, the freedom to walk in that spirit of obedience. And he says, and that is the result when we allow or when we follow or when we even yet where we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Father is Lord. The Holy Spirit is Lord. He's God, he's the I am, he's the creator. He's the uncreated God, he's omniscient. He's omnipotent. Now, paragraph D, in light of the, the mystery of the Trinity and because of often the, the academic nature that is associated with the subject, what happens is many confess the truth of the Trinity but are unsure as to what the, the practical implications are, the benefits of understanding the Trinity. And yet the Scripture, in particular the New Testament, in several places calls us to interact with the Trinity. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, that we've been called to the fellowship of the Son. 1 John 1, 3 John says, that which we've seen, handled, and touched concerning the word of life, we have declared it to you that you may have fellowship with us. And in verse 3, verse, uh, 1 John 1, verse 3, he says, and this is our fellowship. It's with the Father and it's with the Son. Where we are called to interact with the Father and grow to understand his commitment, his love, his affection, his delight for his son. We interact with the father and we understand his love, his commitment, and his delight for the father and the same uh, with the Holy Spirit. And as we begin to interact with the Trinity, there are several things that begin to take place within our hearts, and I'll just highlight a few of them in just a few moments. Paragraph E, and so we are called to understand and experience this, again, this family dynamic between the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And there are two practical ways of how we do that. Number one, we, we meditate on the Scripture 
by, number two, actively engaging with the Godhead. Where we speak to the Father, we speak to the Son, we speak to the Spirit. A paragraph D, page two, and paragraph G, so, so excuse me, paragraph F and paragraph G on page two. I'm not gonna read them, I got two uh, quotes there from a, uh, a theologian named Jürgen Moltmann. But here's essentially what he is saying in paragraph F. Number one, he tells us that understanding the Trinity helps us understand the nature of love. Understanding the Trinity helps us understand the nature of love. Because what we see is that one of the reasons why God is love is because he lives in an eternal community of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That the very nature of love necessitates the giving of oneself to another. I'll say this again. The very nature of love, the very nature of God's love, necessitates the giving of oneself to another. Secondly, the nature of community, true community is understood. When we see, according to the scripture, the relationship between the Father and the Son. And John 13 just gives us this line upon line of insight into how the Father and the Son and the Spirit interact with one another. The third thing that he highlights in this, in, uh, in the paragraph of paragraph E, is that in understanding the Trinity, in interacting with the Father, interacting with the Son, interacting with the Spirit, we begin to understand our purpose. We begin to understand our purpose. How it is that we can partner with God insofar as the unfolding of his plan in the nations of the earth. So the Trinity helps us understand the nature of love. It helps us understand the nature of community. That's why Jesus says, Father, that they would be one as you and I are one. That they would, that they would be in unity in the way that you and I are in unity. The, the model for unity is the Trinity. And thirdly, we begin to understand um, our purpose. Then in paragraph G, paragraph G, what he is saying there is that knowing and understanding the Trinity is not to be simply an academic exercise, but rather it is to fill our hearts with wonder. It is to fill our hearts with worship and go, whoa. <laughs> Where we get fascinated by the mystery of three distinct persons. The Father is God, the Spirit is God, the Son is God, yet there's only one God. The wonder of that. He goes on to say that not only are we to get caught up in the wonder of it, he actually says that we're caught up that intimacy involves participation, that we're called to participate in the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. By talking to the Father, asking the Father how he feels about his Son according to the Word. We talk to the Son and we ask him how he feels about the Father. We, we speak to the Spirit. We can talk to the Father and ask how the Father feels about 
our spouse or about our friend or coworker or just anything. We can talk to the son and ask him how he thinks and feels about the situation, how he thinks and feels about you as an individual. We can talk about this, we can talk to the spirit. And when we do that, we're getting, we're, we're, we are participating in the conversation. And so there's fascination, there in a paragraph G, I'm just kind of interpreting for what he's saying, is there, there's fascination. Number two, there is participation. Uh, I've, I've shared the story uh, before how uh, I, I woke up in the, in the middle of the night, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and uh, I just, you know, couldn't sleep and was sitting in my living room and I was kind of thinking about this some and I thought, you know what, I, I can't sleep. And so I'm just going to use, I'm, I'm just going to pick one of the persons in the Trinity and say something to them. And, it's, I, and so what came to my mind was, Father, I began to think about the Father's love for the Son. And I said, Father, I thank you for loving your Son. Show me more. And this, again, this doesn't happen always, so I just want to kind of put that in perspective, but it happened then. There was an atmosphere that shifted. I mean, the spirit shifted the atmosphere in my living room. I felt him touch my spirit. It was so delightful. I said, oh, I said this is amazing. So I said it again. I said, Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. And just this whoosh. I mean, just the waves of this pressure which is coursing through my being. And I'm like, I'm going to keep saying this until it stops. <laughs> I just kept saying the same thing. And then all of a sudden, I get a text from someone in Florida. He says, Stuart, I'm up right now. And I'm pacing. And I'm praying for you. And, I just, and all I keep saying is grace, grace. Grace over Stuart, grace over Stuart. And, and this was happening at the same time. And so participating in the conversation with the Trinity, talking to the Father about the Son, talking to the Son about the Father, and so forth. And again, we can talk to the Father about how he feels about something that's going on in the nations of the world. That the conversation, according to the scripture, is endless. Just what we can talk about in terms of our participation. So again, fascination. Number two, participation. Fourthly, fellowship. Where there's friendship. There's a friendship dynamic where we're entering into the family dynamic of the Godhead. We don't become God not even remotely, but we get to partake in the conversation. And then fourthly is transformation. Fascination, participation, fellowship, and transformation. But we are actually changed by the interaction. And so what Moltmann is saying is that when it comes to the Trinity, we don't want to just give ourselves to the intellectual exercise. He goes, no, we want to be filled with wonder, fascination. We want to participate. We want to fellowship. And in doing so, we want to be transformed. Let's go to page three. So in John 15... Verse 26, Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. What's interesting is that when Jesus says that I will send the Spirit from the Father, even in that statement, Jesus is claiming to be God. He's claiming to be the God who spoke to the prophets 
all throughout the Old Testament when he said, I will pour out my spirit. I will send the spirit. And here, Yahweh, the I am in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, who was the one speaking to the prophets, says, I will send the spirit. Paragraph A, one of the privileges of the new covenant is that we as the redeemed, uh, we can engage, we can relate, we can interact with the Holy Spirit. Under the old covenant, the Spirit only rested on few uh, related to a task, related to an assignment. The priests were anointed by the Spirit. The prophets in particular were anointed by the Spirit. Kings were anointed by the Spirit. Uh, for instance, in, um, in Psalm 51, the psalm where uh, David's confession uh, related to um, um, his sin with Bathsheba, he prays that, that famous phrase that we're all familiar with. He says, uh, he, says, uh, he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And he says, and he, he goes, take not away your spirit from me. And now there's several things he's referring to, but in the, in the, in the immediate sense what he's talking about, he says, don't take this assignment away from me. Don't do to me what you did to Saul. He's talking about the, the assignment, that the kingly anointing that was, was resting on him. Because again, that was the predominant way that the Holy Spirit was interacting with only a few had the Spirit on them related to a task. But the prophets, they come on the scene and they say, well, there's coming a time, which is known as the new covenant, where the Spirit will be made available to all. Paragraph B, throughout the Old Testament, the Lord promises that there will come a time when he would release the Holy Spirit and that all the redeemed would participate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what happens at the birth of the church, Peter stated that the birthing of the church was deeply tied with the unfolding of the prophecies concerning the release of the Holy Spirit, in particular, Joel chapter 2. That the release of the Holy Spirit was tied deeply with the birth of the church. And that everything about our life as a church is by the Spirit, Holy Spirit activity. What's interesting is that the, uh, the prayers of the apostles, that we pray often in the prayer room, they're all about one thing. They're all about the increased activity of the Spirit in and through the people of God. Paragraph D, here are a couple of prophecies in the Old Testament about the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 4 or 44, verse 3, the Holy Spirit satisfies. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out, when the Holy Spirit is obeyed, interacted with, engaged with, um, he brings satisfaction to the heart. I will pour out on him who is thirsty. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants satisfies us. Again, we talked earlier about the negative emotions, the fear, the offense, the lust, the deception. It is the satisfaction of the Holy Spirit that will bring freedom to our hearts on the inside. Paragraph E. The Spirit will give grace to walk in the ways of God. Ezekiel chapter 36 27, it says, I will put my spirit within you 
and cause you to walk in my statutes. That's a good refrigerator verse. The spirit on the inside will cause us, it produces a spirit, the human spirit of obedience. It changes our desires. It, it, it produces a yes in our hearts to want to obey the Lord and to want to follow his ways. He gives us grace to walk in the ways of God. Ezekiel 37, verse 14. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. It is by the spirit that we are born again and live the Christian life. The very life of God, the very presence of God empowers us it invigorates us, it gives us life, it satisfies us, it empowers us, it, it, he shifts our desires as we yield to his leadership, causing us to walk according to his ways. Ezekiel 39, verse 29, and I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall pour out my spirit. In other words, he goes, I will no longer hide my face because I will pour out my spirit. When the spirit is released, the spirit empowers and facilitates intimate fellowship. That's what he means by I will not hide my face. He facilitates intimate fellowship with the Godhead. Where God the Spirit is the escort into that divine family. I love what it says in, uh, I just want to turn it for a moment, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says in verse 9, he says, For it is written that eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He's saying there are things that God has in store in this life, and there are things in terms of the experience of God upon the heart, and there are things that God has in store in the age to come, and he says, it hasn't entered into the heart of man. Now, seven verses later, he tells us that it, it cannot be comprehended by the natural mind, but, the, but it, it can be discerned by the Holy Spirit. But he goes on to say in verse uh, 10, he says, but God revealed them to us through his spirit. And so verse nine, it, it cannot be comprehended by the natural mind. However, verse 10, the spirit... God the Father has revealed these things to us through the Spirit. And why is that? It's because the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And that's, and that's what I think of when I think about the Holy Spirit being the escort into the family dynamic between the Father and the Son, is that he is the escort into that conversation, and he knows everything about that conversation. I mean, he has searched out everything the Spirit of God has. Paul goes on to say, verse 11, for what a man, he goes, for what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of that man. In other words, he goes, he goes, us as individuals, we are the most intimately acquainted with ourselves by the Spirit that's in us. He goes, even so, the third person of the Trinity is deeply, intimately acquainted with every thought and intent and plan and purpose and passion and delight that exists in the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son. He continues, 
verse 12, now we have not received, excuse me, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, I love this phrase, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Again, the Holy Spirit is the on-ramp into understanding the grace of God, the things that are available to us, the, the, uh, the experience of love upon the heart. To, to receive love, to love God back in obedience, to love others, to experience the joy of God, the peace of God, the delight of God. Many, many, many more things that are available to us. And Paul says that the Holy Spirit wants to show us, and he says it's for free because it's been made available through the cross. Paragraph H, the Holy Spirit, this is amazing. When the Spirit is poured out, it will bring eschatological recovery to the environment of Israel and the nations. <laughs> it will bring in a, an entire environmental shift. It says the wilderness will become a fruitful field. Well, of course, because you, you got to go back to Genesis chapter 1. When the earth was dark, without form, the spirit was hovering over it. God says, let there be light, then there was light, because I believe that when he spoke, it was the spirit that executed the command of God in the created order. It would make sense that the environment would shift when the spirit was poured out, because the spirit is the creator, he is creator of God. Page four. The helper, the spirit in John 13 to 17. Again, in John 15, 16, he refers to him as another helper. Another one, one who is of the same kind and equal, though he is another, but he's equal because he's God. Now, the, the term or the attribute of the Holy Spirit that is repeated more times than any other attribute in John 13 to 17 is that he is the helper. And there are several meanings to um, him being the helper. It refers to, number one, that he, not, not within this order, but that he is an intercessor. Remember in Romans 8, 26, that in our weakness, the Spirit makes intercession for you and me. Number two, it means that he's our advocate. Beloved, the Holy Spirit is for you. <laughs> he is for us. As the Father is for us. As the Son is for us. The Spirit is for us. He's our advocate. It also refers to the fact that he's a representative of another. That he is, in this case, he is here to represent, to carry out the very plans and the very desires of the Son of God. Thirdly, he brings comfort. Now, what is interesting is that he is called, in, at least on three occasions, he is referred to as the helper and the spirit of truth. They, 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 they are put together. And so he's the intercessor, he is the advocate, he's a representative, but he's also the comforter. But here's my point when he comforts, he comforts with truth. I'll say this again. When the Holy Spirit comforts, he comforts with reality. He comforts with 
truth. Paragraph A, one of the uh, beautiful components of John 13 to 17 is that each person of the Trinity is described and Jesus highlights each of their functions and roles between them and their relationship to us as believers. Paragraph B, in John 13 to 17, the Holy Spirit, again, is described as the helper, the parakletos, and the spirit of truth. Now, what is interesting is that, I just want to make a little side point here, is that the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 16, verse 7, in the, in the New American Standard, he is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter uh, 10, verse 20, he is the Spirit of the Father. And so he comes from the Father, sent by the Son of God. And when he comes, in John 13 to 17, because again, there are many, many other passages about the Holy Spirit, but I just want to focus on John 13 to 17. When he comes, there are at least five things that happen. Number one, he comes teaching us the Holy Spirit. Again, part of my aim tonight is to, is to kind of push us out of this idea that we relate with the Spirit only as this, again, this invisible force that does, that comes with unusual manifestations. And that if those unusual manifestations don't happen, then the Spirit is not moving. No, the Spirit is doing more things than just unusual manifestations. He comes teaching. And one of the things that he wants to teach us about, according to John 14, 26, he actually wants to teach us about the union, this interaction that we have with God through the born-again experience that God lives inside of our spirit in full. The implications of it. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, they, he talks about this treasure that we have in earth and vessels. Secondly, not only, not only does he come teaching, he comes revealing the beauty of Jesus. In John 15, 26, it says that, that when the helper comes, who Jesus will send, he says that he will testify concerning me. There's a very serious thing that's on the mind of the Holy Spirit. And that is to, he wants to and he desires to do, I believe, the favorite thing for him to do is to, is to reveal the Son of God. To make him known in us and to make him known to us. The beauty of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of, uh, oh Lord, help me here. There's a lot of claims of the activity of the Holy Spirit, but very little evidence of the proclamation of the beauty of who he is. It's one of the main things that a, a spirit-filled minister of the gospel will do is to speak of the glory of Jesus. In fact, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will testify concerning him, and then in doing so, he will empower us to testify to do the same. When the Spirit comes, he comes teaching, he comes revealing. Thirdly, he comes to dwell with us and in us. I love this, forever. <laughs> forever, the Spirit will live in us. Forever, the Spirit will be teaching us. Forever, the Spirit, I, mean, I can't wait. I mean, a billion years from now, he is going to teach us things about Jesus that will just absolutely blow our minds. Fourthly, he comes teaching, he comes revealing, he comes to dwell, he comes to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Fifthly, he comes to guide and to speak of things to come. 
And whatever he hears, whatever he hears in this Trinitarian dialogue, he speaks to his people. Paragraph C, again, the Holy Spirit as helper, he will primarily help as the spirit of truth. And this is significant because, again, because of the context of John 13 to 17, two days after um, the, the, uh, uh, Jesus' uh, instruction on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, that the, the great eschatological crisis will be that of deception. The greatest eschatological crisis, the greatest end time crisis, and we're seeing the beginnings of it, and it's only the beginnings. The extent to which deception will go, it will make sense that the helper would come and help us primarily as the spirit of truth. He comes speaking truth about many things. But one of the primary things I believe that he comes speaking truth about is number one, speaking the truth of the nature and the character of the Son of God. He comes testifying about Jesus and who he is and his leadership. That as the weeks and years and the decades unfold, it is going to climax, Revelation 13, verse 5, where the Antichrist under the power of the evil one, will blaspheme the name of God. He will blaspheme the very character and the nature of God. And he won't just blaspheme it by standing behind a pulpit and saying weird things, though undoubtedly they'll be part of it. But he will use all of the infrastructure that is at his disposal to fill the culture and to fill the earth in all kinds of clever ways with lies about the Son of God. And Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will help us, but he will help us as the spirit of truth. Testifying about Jesus, testifying about his character and his nature, testifying about his power, testifying about his purpose, testifying about his plan, speaking to us about the things to come, opening up the scripture, number one. Number two, the number two area that will be under massive assault insofar as the deception of Matthew 24 is the word of God. The deception that will come against the truth of God's word. There's this thing that is going on right now and it's kind of like, you know, it's, it is this increasingly cool thing. It's this, the deconstructing of Faith. Whatever that means. And so much of it is actually anchored in the question of whether the word of God is the word of God or not. But here's what Jesus says in John 17, 17. He, he talks, he says, he prays, he says, sanctify them according to your truth. Your word is truth. And so if there's anything that we need in this hour is we need the spirit of truth to help us and we need to cling to the word of truth and asking the spirit of truth to do Psalm 51 verse 6 cause truth to be formed in our innermost part. So we don't need a deconstructing of our faith. We need an encounter with the spirit of truth who forms truth on the inside, who opens up the scripture. Paragraph D, the spirit's primary task is to show us and to teach us about Jesus' beauty and to equip us to do the same. To teach us about Jesus' beauty and to equip us to do the same. 
Again, it's common to limit our understanding and experience of the Holy Spirit to unusual manifestations. However, the primary thing that the Spirit loves to do is to give himself to manifesting and declaring the beauty of Jesus' character, his heart, his power, and his purpose. A couple quick practical things. One of the primary ways that we can grow in understanding the free things that are made available to us by the Spirit is, number one, we want to commit to wholeheartedly obey the Word of God. We're not going to be perfect at it. We are weak and broken, and we will stumble along the way. But, in the, but when we stumble, we don't make excuses for it. We don't blame shift. We acknowledge our sins. We confess it to the Lord. We ask him to forgive us and to cleanse us and to empower us to, to continue on the journey. Secondly, we are committed to the word of God. Committed to the word of God. Thirdly, this, is probably, this one is probably going to run me out of town. But here you go being deeply connected to a spiritual family. <laughs> being connected to a local body in whatever city you live in. Find a local body that preaches Jesus, that upholds the word of God, that believes in the, the furtherance of the gospel, and find yourself in that body to to hear the word of God, to grow, to serve. It's cool right now to not do the church thing. And it's, it's problematic. But part of growing in the experience of the Holy Spirit is by being, again, wholeheartedly committed to obey him, wholeheartedly committed to the word of God. Thirdly, being committed to, uh, to be a part of a spiritual family. Fourthly, uh, by praying with our spirit, praying in our prayer language, speaking mysteries to God, Job, uh, Jude 21, building ourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit, let the worship team come up. Paragraph F, there are four commands on how to engage the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Two of them are positive, and two of them are negative. The first one is Galatians chapter 5, 516, walk in the Spirit. Paul tells us to walk in the Spirit, and the way that we walk in the Spirit is by talking to the Spirit. Again, these, these short, simple phrases throughout the day, thank you, show me more, or help that's my most prayed one. <laughs> this is help. No, really, I'm not being funny. It's, I mean, I laugh, but being for real, that's the most prayed one. I go, help, I need your help. Help, strengthen me. The second one is the command to be filled with the Spirit, which means that we are empowered by the Spirit to obey. In Ephesians 5.18, when he tells us to be filled, he's talking about the experience of God's presence upon the heart that empowers us to obey. Thirdly, is one of the first negatives, do not grieve the Spirit. And the way that we do that, we we. Do not greet the Spirit, Here, here's how, by contending for unity in the church. The grieving of the Holy Spirit has got nothing to do with the worship leader playing five songs instead of six. No, the, uh, the grieving of the Spirit according to uh, Ephesians 4.30 has to do with our speech, has to do with unresolved anger, it has to do with uh, the way that we speak to one another, about one another. 
Paul says, no, he says, do not grieve the spirit. And we do that by contending for unity of the spiritual family we're a part of. And lastly, do not quench the spirit. And we do that by honoring the prophetic direction of the spirit in a spiritual family. There's a sense of what the Lord is doing in a spiritual family. And as we honor that, that uh, Holy Spirit direction, Paul says that we are in, in, involved in a process of not quenching the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's stand.